What's up, people? Welcome to week three um, of this class. I'm recording this on Friday, which is the day that I'm posting this uh, before the Labor Day weekend, which is going to be awesome. I hope that you have something fun lined up. Or some of you might have seen this email come to you uh, on Friday and you go, I'm not, it's not week three yet, bro. So I'm not even going to look at this until Tuesday. So if that's the case, then I hope you had a great Labor Day weekend and that you did something fun and that you chilled and that you relaxed or you did whatever it is that you do and got some, uh, you know, me time. Okay. But now we are here, though, regardless, going into week three. And with that, we are going to get it, go ahead and get into essay one. All right. So look, um, let's see here. Here's our course. This is our class. Everything I'm going over today is in the we weekly lessons tab under week three. Uh, this will be made available to you today, so you can go ahead and access it if you want to. Okay. The, the, the notes I go over are right here. Uh, and then I'll return back to talk about the outline and the reading analysis. Uh, let's see. I'm going to switch those. There you go. Okay. Cool. All right, so let's get started. Essay one, and using research. Here we go. Okay, so essay one assignment. Here go. Here is the description for essay one. All right. For this essay, you will pick a topic of personal interest to discuss. Okay. You start here. Okay. Uh, you will begin by writing a short one paragraph narrative, little anecdote about the topic, then a paragraph defining the topic in your own opinion, and then discuss an example of it. And then you're, you're going to conclude with a discussion on why this topic is important. So you are, we're going to be using the modes of writing, the narrative mode of writing, the definition mode of writing, and the uh, exempl exemplification, all right? mode of writing. So narrative, defining, examples. All right. Essay should meet these minimum requirements. At least two and a half pages, two full pages, and at least half a page. You will lose points if it is less than two and a half pages. Um, MLA formatting. As per the usual, everything needs to be in MLA formatting. You're going to, for this paper, you are going to be required to, to use at least one outside source. So usually, okay, traditionally, uh, the school just doesn't, ha just has you doing research for SA3. And uh, traditionally, they, SA1, SA2 have no sources. And then SA3, they require you to do research and use three outside sources. And I've noticed that over the years that uh, student, that was a hard transition to go from no sources to then SA3 having three sources. And then they would not do well on those. And then they would grade would plummet and is the final essay and they couldn't make it up. Excuse me, they couldn't change anything. So I start, so last year I started changing it where I started requiring people to use one outside source for SA1, two outside, two outside sources for SA2, of course, and then three for SA3. Because in 1102, you use at least three sources in every single paper three to five. Okay. So I think we need to do more gradual inclusion of using sources, quoting sources. Okay. Uh, integrating quotes, all that kind of good stuff. All right. So uh, we're going to begin that with essay one. And then you will have to have, because you're using a source and we're using MLA formatting, you're going to have to have a works cited page. Okay. Here we go. So this is sort of the, um, the way the next four weeks work, all right? Even though you're beginning the essay now, uh, I'm going over right now, it's not due for li literally a month. The essay is due on September 29th, okay? So we got a lot of time, don't fret. You will have more time for essay one than you will have for any of the other essays. I want you to make sure you understand that, okay? That you will not have the same number of weeks for the other essays. We, we spend the most time on essay one, and then, and then we have less time for essay two and three. Um, so you have four weeks to do the following. 
So week three, which is right now, you're going to be deciding on, on a topic that you'll be writing about. You're going to research your topic and you're going to write an outline with a quote from your research all this week. So by the, by, uh, one, by the one week into um, September, you will have your, your essay topic, research, and an outline. Okay. Week four, you're going to write a draft. All right. Um, so that's pretty, you're, you're going to take your, we're going to go from the outline to the draft. And then week five, we're going to do some peer editing. I'm going to do some live demonstrations on editing. Um, I will edit some people's um, papers uh, in the lecture. Okay. And you will then, after you do all that, you will hopefully go to the writing lab during the weeks of five and six. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if your draft is done by the 15th, then you have the 15th, then you have the 16th through the 29th to get to the writing lab. I'll talk more about that later, but understand that the writing lab is free tutoring. Your tuition, whether you paid it or you're, the, the, the state paid it because you're a dual enrollment student, regardless, your tuition pays for free tutoring, free writing tutoring. They won't edit your paper, but they sit down with you and they look at your paper and they show you the things that you are not doing well and they give you tips on how to get better, all right? They might teach it to you. Depends on like the person that you're sitting with. Like, like they could be like me where I sat with a student today on a paper that they were working on and we just had a little lesson on colons and semicolons. I don't know if, that you, can, if you can tell that, all right? And so I noticed that, that they were using colons and semicolons incorrectly. So we just had a little impromptu lesson right there. That's different than them like changing it for you. Okay. Um, I, I'll tell you this. Listen to me. I was an English major, but I still went to the writing lab. Okay. I did not learn how to write well or to uh, master grammar until I went to the writing lab as a student. Um, I needed the one-on-one -on -one instruction to be taught to me. Um, and like, I was an idiot. I mean, you know, you think of like a college English, uh, major that, that they would be, um, that they would excel, uh, at grammar. Uh, but I, that was not me. I was an English person because I was into ideas and I talked too much and I like to read and I wanted to talk about those kind of things. And so like, I cared more about, uh, when, when, when I, when I was younger, I cared more about writing, uh, out my ideas, not, having these uh, perfectly uh, crafted, grammatically correct phrases and sentences. It was about my interpretation that I wanted to get out. So um, it wasn't until, uh, so I, I just did not have very good control over my grammar until I started going to the writing lab and I got individualized help. Uh, in college, professors do not really teach much about uh, grammar and punctuation and those types of things. Because the idea is that those will be mastered in high school, um, which me being a high school teacher, I know is not true. Okay. And so, but it's not part of our curriculum. It's not part of the way that the courses have been written at the college level. So I'm telling you, go to the writing lab. If, if, um, and maybe it will take the first essay, maybe it will take the first essay for me to mark up all your grammatical problems for you to go to the writing lab, but save yourself a lot of trouble. Go to the writing lab. They will point out the errors. They won't change them for you. They will point them out and then y'all can talk about them. And if they're like, hey, you should have used a semicolon here. And you go, I don't know what a semicolon does. Then you, they can teach it to you. All right. So it's great. You should definitely, again, though, you have to sit with them. I mean, I would go for a, like an hour. I would sit with them and we would go over it. All right. And, and I would soak it up. And then after a while, I stopped going because I didn't need to go anymore because I, I, I'd i gotten it, you know? So that's something that's really important, all right? Um, so that'll be the, the 16th through the 29th. And then you have a whole week to to finish your, uh, your um, essay. Now, you might be like, look, listen, y'all, the workload is, is, is very much reducing. I mean, for, uh, from the draft to the essay, you know, three weeks and stuff, and so during this time, you should be reading your memoir. Um, everyone was supposed to have, by the end of this weekend, signed up for a memoir. Not signed up. You, you should have told me what memoir you're reading, okay? And then you need to go out and get the copy of it, and you need to start reading it. 
So like I have built time into the schedule for you to be reading your memoir. Okay. So you really, really, you might be like, you know what? I don't really care about any of chapter four. I'm not going to read chapter four. I'll, I'm going to write a draft of my essay. I'll go to the writing lab later so they can tell me how crappy it is and we can fix it together. I'm going to spend most of week four reading my memoir. Cool. Do that. Same thing with um, week five. Maybe you're like, I, I, I'm not going to read chapter four and five. Thanks for the suggestion, buyers. But instead, I'm just going to go to the writing lab and they're going to teach me some stuff, help me out with some stuff. And I'm going to use this time to read my memoir. Cool. And then you go to the writing lab this week, uh, five, and they help you with your essay and you read it, you know, you, you fix it all and you're done. And then you're like, hey, look, turns out week six, I don't have any homework because I've already finished my, my essay. It's as good as it's going to be. I am not doing anything more. So then you spend all of week six reading your memoir a little bit every night. Okay. So you need to have, make sure that you give yourself time and that you respect the fact that you need to read, be reading the, the memoirs, all right, that, you, that you've chosen. All right, cool. Okay, so here we go. All right, how your essay will be outlined. This week, you're writing an outline, and I have an outline for you, all right? You're just filling it all in. You're just filling in the blanks, okay? This, this is not a suggestion. This is how it should go, okay? Um, I'm going to do a lesson at some point about people who use AI. Okay. But one of the biggest indicators of AI is that people, um, will use an AI essay and it would not be, uh, outlined the way that I've told you to outline your essays. Okay. The outline is the, essentially the direction that your essay is going in and the direction in which it flows. So you write an outline and then you write your paper to reflect that same outline, okay? So this is how I expect everybody's paper to flow. Introduction. Your introduction will be your narrative anecdote, okay? Paragraph one, body paragraph one, is your definition of your, of your topic, to the term. You gotta have a quote. I'm gonna go over all of this today. You're gonna have to have a quote and a source for this um, definition. Body paragraph two is your exemplification paragraph where you provide examples, okay, examples. And then you have your conclusion, all right, your reflection. Now, if you want if you want to change up, when you write your paper, if you wanna change up the um, organization of this stuff, um, then email me and let me know that it's intentional, okay? If you're like, look, I really wanna begin here, because I want to, I want to, I want to move this to the middle. Okay, cool. That means that you're intentionally doing that. You're not just using AI. Uh, and so you can email me and say, "Hey, buyers, I have this idea that I want to move my anecdote to this part, and I want to switch this." Okay, I want to begin with examples. You know, just kind of like be a little different. Cool. You've emailed me. You told me this is what you intend on doing. This is this is your your idea. Great. Run with it. Okay. But. If you don't email me to let me know, then I expect it to be like this. Therefore, then if it's not like this and you did not email me, you're gonna lose points. Okay. All right, pick a topic. This essay has one topic that you are discussing through three different techniques and it should be personal to you. Something that you're, because I'm not having you do a lot of research, I don't want you to be doing something that you have to like teach yourself about, okay? Something personal to you. Possible topics. What makes a horror novel? I love horror fiction. Uh, I know I was an English major and I read a lot of highbrow literature. Um, and I respect that stuff, but also like in terms of just like enjoying something for the fun of it, I love horror uh, novels. Uh, and books and stuff. So I could write about that because I've read enough of those. Um, what is beauty? We all have different ideas. Of, it's very philosophical. What is beautiful? Okay. Uh, if you have a strong opinion on beauty, then you can write about that. It's your soul. What is the good life? Um, a buddy of mine just came in and talked to my students about the future, about their careers. And he was like, yeah, you know, this... 
if you want to live the good life, these are the things that you need to acquire in your job. Something, you know, something that you enjoy, something that, that does good for other people, blah, 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 blah. All right. So if you, if you have these like tenets of like the good life is, means this, this is why this is the good life. I'm going to define to you what the good life means. And I'm going to show you examples of people who are living the good life. Then uh, write about the good life. Okay. What is the best fitness routine? Maybe you're a big fitness enthusiast. Okay. And um, so you're like, man, you know, it's all about isolation. Get that like Arnold physique and stuff. Or if you're like, no, dude, it's splits, bro. It's splits, man. We got to work out multiple parts each day, but not full body though. And then maybe, or maybe you are like full body. No, every day, full body. We're, we're going to do this. All right. So uh, you're a CrossFitter. Okay. Maybe you, you're, you want to write about fitness. These are just, these are just random things. All right. It, it really is supposed to be about anything that thing that you really want. Okay. One person wrote about one girl wrote about K-pop, a whole paper about K-pop. Okay. So to each their own. All right. <laughs> what is trap music? Please tell me. All right. After you pick your topic, you got to find a quote. All right. You got to find a quote. Now, listen, here is the stipulation by the quote. There's a lot of people who are going to do this incorrectly. I'm going to be annoyed. Okay. You need to find a quote that you will use in your essay, but the quote shouldn't be your definition of the topic you are writing about. You are not finding it. You don't have to find a quote. I don't want you to find a quote. That's a definition. All right. That's not what I'm looking for. It should be a quote used to better illustrate your explanation of the topic. All right. It should be used in your definition paragraph. But help to help us kind of better understand it. It's not a definition, though. Okay. So, for example, let's say I was writing about systemic racism. All right. I talk about how the definition of systemic racism is about how uh, there are uh, systems put in American culture um, that are rooted in racist intentions. Okay. So we could talk about how we could talk about things like like um, voting requirements uh, that these traditionally were racist uh, because it, they um, they were put in place as barriers to keep people of color from being able to vote. Okay, redlining was a systemic racist um, um, method of of organizing neighborhoods into pockets of race. All right. So then I'm going to have this quote. Let's start with what systemic racism is, which is not systems full of racists. Black people aren't dying in such numbers because all or even most white people around them hate them and want bad things to happen to them. So like I'm having this, I'm using this quote. This is not defining sy systemic racism. This is talking about how though, how like systemic racism is often um, continued uh, and perpetuated through people who would consider themselves to be non-racists, in fact, okay? These are systems that were created a long time ago by actual racists, but those people have died. And now we just continue many of these same methods thinking that, like, you know, they're common sense systems or that they're effective systems without realizing that they were actually uh, rooted in racist motivations. So I, you know, have this quote, all right, to kind of help shine better light on this idea that like non-racist people can still be complicit in systemic racism unknowingly <laughs> put that in your pipe and smoke it <laughs> okay anyways and this came from a washington post article which i'm gonna go in a moment i'm gonna show you i'm gonna talk about next about where to find your sources okay all right sources acceptable for this paper okay we, there will be other papers where we write that are more academic, papers that are rooted in like the, the library and Galileo and all that kind of jazz. But for this paper, this paper, I have more specific places I want you to write, I mean, to, to go to, okay? We're keeping it simple. We're keeping it simple, but still reliable, but simple, all right? So I want you to go to news sources, editorials, the New York Times, Vulture, the Atlantic, Slate, The Guardian, The Economist, 
Forbes, The Washington Times, Psychology, Psychology Today, New York Magazine, and they can be very it can be very skewed. Rolling Stone, Fox, CNN. There will be times where I'll say you can't use some of these. There's a, I'll tell you specifically can't use these for the for this paper. You can use these for this paper. Okay, so um, this paper is not the emphasis of this paper is not necessarily on like research. This, the emphasis of this paper is modes of writing. And I'm gonna look at it, see if you can integrate the quote correctly, which I'm gonna go over in a moment. If I hurry up, good God. Okay, 20 minutes, we can do this. All right, published books. Some of you might actually have these things called books on your bookshelves and they're very useful. I, I, these are, I don't know if you can see, those are my books, okay? And they're classroom books, but they're actually my personal books uh, that I read and that I just bring here, okay? Um, so you might have books that you have on some of these topics. Um, like if I, if I was writing about systemic racism, I could be using a bunch of these books. Uh, I have some of my kids reading an excerpt from one of these books called Stamped from the Beginning, the history, uh, the definitive history of racist ideas in America. Fantastic book. You should read it. Um, I think I have a PDF copy of the entire book. I could send you if you email me. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Things you cannot use, do not use list. Don't use the dictionary.com. Do not use online encyclopedias. Do not use organization websites. Do not use university websites. You cannot use a source that does not have an author. Okay. If it's a website, you can't use those. If it is an article published by some sort of news source that has an author, okay, you can use it. A lot of these have editorials. These have opinion pieces. All right. So I do not want a dictionary or encyclopedia um, entry. All right. Well, I'm looking for, for you to read professional writers, not just information, but writers. Okay. If you have any questions, let me know. Steps. All right. So um, first you got to figure out, you know, figure out what your topic will be. And then you will Google, Google search. Do a Google search for your topic. Again, this is not a research. I'm not, I'm not teaching research methods right now. This is That's not for this paper. There will be future papers in this class and 1102 where you, it's, it's specifically about the research. This is not. All right. So Google is a great search engine for this paper. Find a source from a journalistic source. Okay. Must have an author. All right. For example, you, you could be writing about, you know, you're excited about football season. Yay, football season, can't wait. Falcons have a new quarterback, Kirk Cousins. Got rid of Ritter, fantastic, okay. So maybe, you know, quarterbacking's on your mind. And so you wanna write a paper about what differentiates a good quarterback from a bad quarterback. You want to define a good quarterback, okay? So you might literally just, to, you know, search this in. What differentiates a good quarterback quarterback from a bad quarterback? And I like to, to go ahead and type in Maybe my source, you know, maybe type in like, oh, you know, I, if I'm going to read an article about football, I want it to come from ESPN or uh, NFL Network. OK, so like I would just type in what differentiates a good quarterback from a bad quarterback, question mark, ESPN. And then when I do that, OK, I get all of these NFL Jaws, what makes a, a great NFL quarterback, NFL quarterback council 2023, ranking top 10 QBs by trade. Ex, uh, executives, coaches, scouts, rank. Okay. These are all articles that I could um, select. Now, I, I would probably go with these two because 2024 versus 2012. Okay. But, you know, sometimes quarterback characteristics are timeless. So I could use any of these for my paper. All right. Read the article and find one short. Oh, I just whistled. One short quote that you can use in your essay, all right? Again, it shouldn't be defining, you know, the definition, but it's more like explaining details, okay? All right. Um, let's look at that example real fast, okay? So here we are in the week three folder. Week three, I went to weekly lessons. Week three, okay, here's your outline, all right? 
I guess I'll put it back up here. Okay, fine. I'll switch them. Outline example, outline template. You can download this outline template. Let's see if I already have it open. And it's all there for you. Okay. You just double click, put your name, put your first and last name here, leave that, leave that. And I think that's the right date already. Uh, yep. Okay. So leave all that, give yourself a title and then write a little short little, you know, you just fill out all the information on here. Okay. Save it. Um, and then submit it. This is what it should look like. I have here an example. Look, outline example essay one. I don't know why I just clicked on it. I have it right here. Okay. So this is the way yours should look. Um, oh, I did old school Smith, all cap, all capital. That's how it used to be. But now though, they're fine with it being lowercase, whatever. All right. So let's say my essay is about the horrors of modern fiction. What? Yikes. Oh my God. Narrative anecdotes. Summary of the, of the story. I'm going to discuss the summer that I read Stephen King's It. I was 13, maybe 12, and I think I was way too young to have read the book. It was not only terrifying, but for a 13-year-old, uh, it was pretty pornographic. Violent, crude, it was demented, but also very exciting. All right. So that's that's basically what, what, what I'll be writing about. I'm not writing the whole anecdote in my outline. I'm just writing a few points to run, run myself for when I do write the essay. That's what I'll be discussing. Okay, definition. So in the template here, it says definition, term, summary of definition, quote, source, okay? So here, I have all this. I have, my term is modern horror. And in my own words, me, my own words, modern horror is a lot more inclusive of all, of all types of people and audiences. The characters in modern horror span different nationalities, gender, sexual orientations, religions, and nationalities. It exposes audience to not just different horrific situations, but also just different experiences in the lives of the people who are not like me. Okay. So then I, I, I found this quote. They have, all, they, they have all really pushed the envelope when it comes to new perspectives on the tradition, as in the horror tradition, especially bringing in alternative folklores and marrying them with Western white tropes. Like recently, you know, there's that one um, movie that is about the, that folkloric ghost story. Uh, is it Lorana, Lorena, about the woman in Mexico who uh, wears the white dress and she walks around searching for her children, her dead, her children, but she just ends up killing other children, thinking that they're her kids. Or, or maybe she she goes to, she thinks that they're her kids so that she gets them but then she when she realizes that they're not her kids then she kills them anyways um you know th these these um interesting dark twisted uh characters from other cultures have definitely in the last 20 years made their way into um your traditionally American um storylines so that's great Slightly lesser known writers like Cassandra Kahl are also making waves. Her recent novella, Nothing But Blackened Teeth, is a new take on J horror, um, unmitigated by the usual Western dilution. Meanwhile, these people are writing really sharp social commentary horror. Okay. And then this came from my source. I have, I have my, um, my um, web address. I'm like blanking here. I'm like, what am I? Uh? having a little stroke no all right this right here is the url okay uh, and it's this comes from the guardian which is a, a a fine um source it's on it's on the powerpoint so you can use it see it's the guardian it's british it's british sorry if i just insulted someone from england okay that was terrible okay um, exemplification, summary of example, I will talk about the books All Hallows, which, which covers racially and sexually diverse characters. Um, Chasing the Boogeyman, which deals with diverse ethnic groups. And Megan Abbott books, which is female-centered. I will talk about those in my paper. And then conclusion, why did you want to talk about this topic? I've always loved horror literature and has been interesting watching it change, which is great for my students. Because I teach multicultural literature, which we cover a lot of different uh, perspectives. We're actually doing a film analysis, which y'all we're, uh, which you do, I think, in eleven oh two on Candyman. 
That's great. Anyways, this is my outline. All right. If your outline, the only thing I would say about this one though is that it does need to be, when you submit your outline, it should be all in the same font. I don't care which font, as long as it's the same font and the same um, um, size. Let's make sure that all of this is correct here. All right, there we go. All right, great. So that's ready to be submitted. If this was your paper, your outline, you'd get a 100, okay? So that is the example and the template, and then you submit it there. All right, cool. Now let's talk about what you're gonna be doing with reading analysis assignment two, which directly connects to um, your essay. Okay, so if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be getting a quote, finding a quote to use in the source, you gotta understand how to, how to, how to do it, all right? So um, I have 10 minutes, I'm gonna go over this kind of quickly. This is gonna help you with this week's assignment out, besides the outline, is you practicing integrating a quote. When I grade um, assignment two, I'm just looking to see at the quote. I'm only, you, you are gonna be integrating a quote into a paragraph and all I'm doing is seeing if you do it correctly. All right, so that way I can say yes or no, and that way you can um, uh, feel good about your essay one, all right? So integrating quotes into your writing, no drop quotes. Quotes cannot stand by themselves as complete sentences. When you pull a quote out, you have to use it correctly and you have to do what's called integrate it into a sentence, okay? Quotes that stand by themselves as complete sentences. These are drop quotes and they are incorrect, okay? You have to use what's called a signal phrase to lead into the quote, all right? A quote cannot be a sentence all on its own because then in that case, it's a drop quote, all right? So let me just show you what this, what, what, what this looks like, okay? Here we have a quote from Plato. The unexamined life is not worth living. All right, so here we have, there are many examples of self-analysis in Plato's philosophy, period. The unexamined life is not worth living. This is incorrect because we have a sentence, we have a period, and then we have a, the quote. The quote's all by itself in between two periods. That's incorrect. This one's incorrect, same thing. Plato thinks people should analyze their own lives, period period, quotation mark, the unexamined life is not worth living, quotation mark, period, that's incorrect, okay? We have to integrate the quote. It needs to be in one sentence. Plato thinks people should analyze their own lives because, because, quote, the unexamined life is not worth living, quotation, all right? This is how you integrate a quote, all right? That needs to be, the quote itself needs to be part of a sentence that you've written, okay? It cannot be on its own. This is incorrect. This is correct with this conjunction because. Always introduce quotations with a signal phrase before they appear in your paper, okay? So something like the author. The author comments, describes, explains. The author points out, the author relates, the author says, the author claims, the author analyzes, okay? Do not begin or end paragraphs with a quotation. So you have to introduce the quotes. And then also when you're right, your quotes should be in the middle of your paragraphs, okay? Uh, Cause you, the, you begin a paragraph with a claim like we've already discussed. And then you have support. The quote is, is part of your support. It's not the only support, but it's part of the support. And then you have analysis. So the only time you should be quoting is in the middle part of your paragraph, all right? Sample paragraph about the writing style of Stephen King. Okay. So look, here's a sample paragraph, all right? This is this is part of a paragraph. This is actually a there's actually a much longer part of this paragraph, but I did not include all of it. Okay, I just I just included the the lead up to the quote. The archetypal Stephen King character is defined by the following characteristics: white male, 
either a teacher or writer, middle age, witty, relatively calm, and emotionally balanced, not a hothead, nor emotionally sensitive. An initial reluctance, revulsion, or hesitation to violence, and finally, sociable. Those are always, his main characters are always like that, okay? And along with this usual conventional and repetitive main character, his stories tend to carry with them slightly more theme than other traditional horror writers. Aja Romano, writing for Vox magazine, discusses how King's writing has always displayed significant literary qualities, particularly ongoing literary themes that have shaped how we understand horror as well as ourselves. While his novels contain intense violence and disturbing actions, there's never a celebration of such carnage. Okay, so we have my claim it's defined by the following characteristics and I, uh, I provide all these, okay? Um, and then I talk about how they also, they, they tend to have theme. And then I have his reign has always displayed significant literary qualities, particularly on, ongoing literary themes that have shaped how we understand her as well as ourselves. Okay. Um, and then I, I add some more discussion. All right. This paragraph does not end with a, um, quote. In fact, if I showed you the, again, I, I, I shortened the paragraph to make it larger, um, this is a paragraph from the sample essay that I'll post in a few weeks of, um, of essay one. All right. And so it should not be at the beginning and it should not be the very last sentence. It should be in the middle section. All right. Um, now this style right here, this is how I really think that you should integrate your quote into your paper. You should mention the author's name and what you know, who are they writing for? All right. Um, in his Psychology Today article, therapist Dr. John Wefner says, blah, 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 blah. All right. You need to state who the author is and who they wrote, who they write for, and then lead into their quotes. All right. That is um, how I really want you to, to do that. Okay. All right. So all this deals with reading analysis assignment number two. Before completing this assignment, you must have done the following. Read, It's Time for They by Farhad Manju. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. It's in your textbook. After finishing the reading, complete this assignment. On an MLA formatted document, you are going to write one paragraph answering the following prompt. Here we go. What do you think about the current discussion on pronouns? Do you think it is a conversation worth having? Or do you think nothing needs to change about pronoun usage? Okay. This is an opinion piece. I don't care about your opinion. <laughs> okay. Like, I mean, you know, I care that you have an opinion, but like, I'm not grading you on your opinion. You can, you can uh, think, you know, adjusting pronouns is fantastic. You can think it's a waste of time. I don't care. Okay. Um, you can sound like an ultra liberal. You can sound like an ultra conservative. I don't care. All I'm going to be grading is this right here. Okay. You have to integrate a quote from the article. So you got to pull something that is said in this article. You can use a quote to support what you believe. Like I like, you know, I, you know, um, I, I support what, what Farho Manjo says when he writes blah, 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 blah. Or you can use a quote to contrast what you believe. All right. I believe what I believe that Farah Maj is wrong when he says, and then you quote him. Okay. The quote needs to be integrated and cited correctly, as demonstrated in the lecture and lecture notes. Okay. And it should not show up in your paragraph until after you've stated your claim. So you're going to pull a quote from him and you're going to put it in, in your uh, paper. All right. Again, I'll be grading you on proper MLA formatting, the use of a quote and the structure of your paragraph. I will not be grading you on your opinion. My personal opinion on this topic doesn't matter. So your paper, so your article, your, I'm sorry, your, your assignment, your paragraph isn't about Farhad's article. The paragraph is about what do you think about pronouns these days 
should we be looking at and using pronouns for the way people want them to be used, like he or she or they, or should we just use pronouns the way we want to use them ourselves, okay? You are gonna be using a quote from Farhad's um, essay. So you need to say his name in the lead up to the quote, all right? So we're integrating a quote. We're not having a drop quote. Email me if you have any questions. That assignment is located right here, okay? So you are using Farhad's quote, I mean, article to talk about what you think about pronouns, all right? So um, integrate his quote, mention his name in the article, and I'm gonna see how well you do. All right, y'all, take it easy now. I uh, hope that makes sense, and email me if you have any questions. Okay, bye-bye.